Everyone loves a hero story. It's satisfying to see good overcome evil and then ride off blissfully into the sunset. But there's a long history of stories with heroes who don't get their happily ever after. According to Aristotle, the function of these so-called tragic heroes was to provide a catharsis, or a release of emotions for the audience when a fatal character flaw led to the hero's untimely demise. The tragic hero is meant to be the face of a cautionary tale, but Irish folklore offers an interesting take on this classic archetype in the story of Cuchulain, a gifted warrior who knew from childhood that he would live a short but legendary life. Cuchulain is considered by many to be the greatest hero in Irish mythology, with only one real rival for the top spot, the hunter Finn McCool. Most of our knowledge of these and other figures from Celtic folklore come from records taken by Christian monks in the 11th and 12th centuries. Before that, the people we now call the Celts, thanks to ancient Greeks, were an oral society. They passed knowledge from one generation to the next in the form of stories, poems, or songs that were recited and memorized. The Celts were a collection of culturally similar but independent tribes who traveled from the Alps around 1200 BCE and spread across much of Western Europe by the 3rd century BCE. Rome conquered much of Europe two centuries later, but the northern parts that became Ireland, Scotland, and Wales remained mostly unbothered for another several hundred years. The monks' records don't reveal too much about Celtic societies, and it's impossible to say how their Christian perspective influenced the writing we do have. But we know that the Celts understood astronomy, respected nature, and valued cattle so highly that wars were often fought as cattle raids or one-on-one -on -one duels between champions. Remember that, because it will come up later. Modern scholars have divided the stories from these records into four roughly chronological cycles. Mythology, Ulster, Fenian and historical. Each cycle is full of really interesting stories, and if you want to learn about some of the mythology cycle, check out the Monstrum episode on Celtic fairies. Woo! <laughs> but here, we'll focus on the Ulster cycle, which is set around the time of Christ and heavily features the life of the warrior, Cúchulain. Born with the name Satanta, anyone could tell Cuchulain was destined to be a hero from the beginning, simply because his birth was so remarkable. Cuchulain's mother was a woman named Dectina, the sister of Conchobar Mechnessa, king of Ulster or Ulid, the region of Northern Ireland for which the folkloric cycle is named. Satanta's father was the sun god Luke, one of the mythical Tuatha de Danann. There are multiple versions of Satanta's birth story. In one, Dectina and her handmaidens are whisked away on the eve of her wedding to the mystical Otherworld, where she accidentally drinks a tiny version of Luke and becomes pregnant. In another, Cuchulain is conceived thrice. At first, he was born to a woman who Dectina helped through labor thanks to Luke's interference, but he died in childhood as Dectina's foster son. Next, he was conceived in a dream Dectina had of the sun god look, but she aborted the pregnancy because she was married to a mortal man. Finally, Dectina became pregnant by her husband and was urged by Luke to name the baby boy Satanta. When Satanta was a young boy, around six in most versions of the tale, he earned himself a new name. He traveled with his family to the home of the blacksmith Cullen for a feast, where he was separated from the group and came face to face with the smith's vicious guard hound. Despite his youth, Satanta defeated the hound and then promised to act as the smith's new guard dog in recompense. Thus, Cull Cullen, or Cullen's hound, was born again. The next year, Cuchulain overheard a prophecy spoken by his maternal grandfather, the druid Katbad. It said that anyone who took up arms on that day would have eternal fame, but live a short life. Cuchulain approached the king that very day and asked to begin his warrior training, thus sealing his fate. Cuchulain was sent to Scotland to train with the renowned fighter Skahach, who gifted him his legendary spear, Gay Bulga, which could travel at lightning speeds and shoot 30 little barbs from its tip. Cuchulain was naturally strong and fast thanks to his divine parentage, but while he was away, he really learned the ways of both war and love. He even sired a son, whom he later accidentally killed, by Skahak's daughter, despite the fact that he was betrothed to a woman back in Ireland. By the time he returned to his homeland, Cuchulain was a young man, often described as short and notably beardless with fuzzy hair, though it was said that the women of Ulster were driven mad with lust for him. As perhaps the most skilled of the king's Red Branch warriors, it was Cuchulain's responsibility to protect his land and people. Whenever his strength, speed, and training weren't enough to defeat a foe, Cuchulain relied on his special power called the Riastrad. Much like a Norse berserker, Cuchulain could change form in battle. 
He grew to nine feet tall, and one of his eyes either bulged or rolled back in his head, and a haze of blood appeared around his fuzzy mane. When Cucullin was in this state, he was invincible, and so enraged he couldn't tell friend from foe. No one was safe from his ire, and it was nearly impossible to bring him back to normal. Upon returning home from a particularly violent mission, Cucullin, still gripped by the Riestrad, demanded to be given an opponent to fight, or else he would kill everyone in the entire fortress. Instead of offering up a victim, the leaders of Ulster sent out a group of naked women. Cucullin was so embarrassed by the sight that he averted his gaze, giving the other warriors time to restrain him and dunk him in water until he calmed down. The people of Ulster were grateful for Cucullin's murderous rage, however, when their kingdom was invaded by the army of Canuck's warrior Queen Maeve. Remember when Moya told you cattle were valuable in ancient Celtic societies? Well, Maeve's master plan was to amass empire-building wealth by stealing Ulster's prize bull. On the day of the attack, all of the soldiers in Ulster's army were struck down by a curse that gave them menstrual pangs and prevented them from fighting. To that, I say two things. One, this wouldn't have happened if you had more women warriors who already knew how to fight through the pain. And two, it was Kulkullin's time to shine. In what became known as the legendary Tanbo Quelnya, or the cattle raid of Cooley, 17-year-old Kulkullin single-handedly fought off Maeve's army one soldier at a time for days, until the rest of the Ulster men recovered enough to back him up. Maeve's army was forced to retreat, but it wouldn't be their last invasion of Kulkullin's home. In a classical tragedy, this would be about the time that Kulkullin would be lured from the path of greatness by his fatal flaw. He would demonstrate too much hubris or get caught up in a web of his own lies. But instead of a fatal flaw, it's something called a gesh that leads to Kulkullin's demise. Gesha are taboos or curses, or can even be seen as gifts bestowed upon people by their parents, a druid, or some other authority figure. To break a gesh is to bring about extreme misfortune. Kokolin's behavior was constrained by two gesha. He must accept any food offered to him by a woman, and he must not eat dog meat. If you are familiar with common folklore tropes, you might be able to see where these unfortunately contradicting taboos will lead our hero. When Cucullin was 27 years old, Queen Maeve and one of his other enemies, Lugaid Mech Kuroi, invaded Ulster. On his way to the battle, Cucullin was tricked into accepting hound meat from a group of women, breaking one gesh to uphold another. The strength and power were immediately sapped from his body, and he was made vulnerable to weapons. Cucullin was mortally wounded in that battle by one of Lugaid's spears, but he didn't go down without a fight. In one last heroic move, Cucullin tied himself to a standing stone and faced down his opponents. Even in death, his reputation kept the other army at bay for more than a day until a raven landed on his body and broke the illusion. Cucullin likely wasn't based on a real person, but the legendary figure continues to inspire and influence in modern-day Ireland. You can find murals and statues dedicated to him around the country, and references to him can be found in media around the world, like the popular myth-based video game Smite. In classical literature, according to Aristotle, tragic heroes were defined by their fatal flaw and untimely death. One could argue that Kulkullin fits this mold and that his fatal flaws were the hubris, impulsivity, and desire for fame that led him to fulfill Cuthbad's prophecy at the age of seven. But Kulkullin's death wasn't too early at all. He always knew his days were numbered, and he got exactly the destiny he wanted. He lived the rough-and-tumble life of a warrior, built a reputation as a truly fearsome opponent, and continued to live on in national memory for thousands of years. Sorry, Aristotle, but that doesn't sound very tragic to me. 